So we're back this week with another video. Um, there's a topic that's already come up in some of the videos in this series already, but um, it's important enough that I really wanted to do a little bit of a deeper dive into it. So I'm gonna do a couple of videos, one of my own, and I just wanted to also kind of get Paul's um, expansion on the concept of um, the multiple stages or the four stages of bearing failure. Um, so I'll turn it over to Paul to kind of break down what that is and um, and how we use it in vibration analysis. So one of the things that with vibration, of course, we know that vibration is a part of any predictive maintenance program. So one of the parts of that predictive maintenance program, probably the biggest part of that predictive maintenance program, is we're predicting when not only do we find the fault, but then we also predict when that fault is going to fail. So you're going to find in vibration that most of the stuff that you're going to deal with and a lot of stuff in vibration is going to be just this here. You're going to be dealing with bearings, okay? Bearings are the most sensitive part of any piece of equipment. They're the first thing that are going to go with that piece of equipment and basically because of the clearances inside this bearing. Basically, once this bearing is loaded, we have probably a few ten thousandths of an inch of clearance inside this bearing. So very small clearance. This bearing can hardly handle any misalignment whatsoever. It's gonna wear this bearing out. And so with it really helps with a predictive maintenance program is not only do we, we identify the fault in this bearing, so we got an outer race defect or we got an inner race defect or whatever we have in this bearing, but then also it's very helpful if we give a prediction of how long this bearing is gonna last. So with vibration, there's certain stages of bearing failure that we can identify in the spectrum. So when I look and I see a bearing or I pick up a bearing fault, what I can do is by looking at these different stages of bearing failure and the way my spectrums look, I can basically predict how long that bearing's gonna last. So not only do I tell my boss that I got an outer race defect in this uh, FAG 6306 bearing here, whatever out of whatever machine it is, but I can also tell them that this bearing will last for another six months, it'll last for another year. So what that enables us to do is plan for that. So we don't get any surprises in the middle of the night. We don't get any of this breakdown maintenance. What we do is I tell them we have a bearing and then we have time to order the bearing, to get the manpower available or the person power available, I guess I should say these days, in order to change that bearing out. So it gives us time to plan what we're going to do. So instead of having a maintenance department that's just going from one catastrophe to the next catastrophe, or basically you're following the smoke is what you're doing. This thing's on fire, we go fix it, the next thing blows up. With predictive maintenance approach, what we can do is, like I said, is that on the shut next Wednesday, we can fix bearing A, bearing B, bearing C, and then bearing D, E, and F. They're not gonna, they're gonna last longer. So we can put our resources where we need them. There's always a manpower cruncher. There's always a crunch for people in that. So it allows us to use our resources, uh, to, the, to utilize our resources the best way possible. And so with a bearing, once again, here's our spectrum. So our spectrum we an amplitude on the side and then we have frequency along the bottom here on our spectrum. And so what happens when we have a bearing defect or when I pick up a bearing defect in the early stages is that it will show up at a different place on the spectrum. And so at phase, let's say phase four or the early stages of the bearing failure, whatever, let's say stage one, the early phase, what will happen is that bearing, and we talked about this before, I think I mentioned it, is that a bearing defect will happen subsurface. So it doesn't crack the raceway on the outside and then go into the bearing. What happens is beneath the raceway, the bearing gets soft, and then every time a rolling element goes across there, that flexes, flexes, flexes until finally it breaks. So in the early stages of a bearing, if you took that bearing out and looked at it, you would never even see the bearing. And so what happens is, is this soft spot, what happens is that soft spot heats up a bit, and then every time a roller goes across it, it sticks to the raceway as it comes off, it makes a little popping sound or gives these really, really high frequency energy bursts. So what you'll see is a pattern for a bearing. So remember our patterns, here's an outer race, there's an inner race pattern, there's different patterns we can talk about. But what it will do is show up way out here at these high frequency ranges. So of course here's zero frequency all the way out here to infinity. The farther you go right, the higher your frequency ranges. So what will happen is this bearing in phase one will show up here 
really high frequency range. So it'll show you the shape if I measured between here and here. It would give me the frequency of an outer race if I measured from here to here, give me the same frequency of the outer race. But it's way up here at the high frequency ranges. So I know that it's early stage, this bearing, I'm not even gonna be able to see it. Okay, so then the stage two, what happens is, is that the bearing, finally the outer surface cracks. And now every time a roller goes across there, grabs a little bit of metal or a little small, as we call it, flakes a little bit of metal off. So what happens now is that the sound gets lower. So if you listen here, it'd be like really, really high sound. And then in the next phase, what happens is this goes away. And then we see it farther down the spectrum. So the same shape, the outer race will be measured here, will come out to the outer race frequency, but it's moved down because the spall is getting bigger. We can see the sound, or we can see the spall. And if we listen to this, it's now instead of zzz, it's like zzz. So the frequency, remember the frequency is going down. So that noise, as the noise goes down, the frequency of that noise goes down. Hard to wrap your head around, and it takes a while, some experience, but, and so what we're seeing is the bearing here in stage two. We know there's a little mark in there, but it's very small. There's still a lot of life left in this bearing yet, okay? It can still run for a long time, especially an oil-fed bearing runs longer than a grease-fed bearing because the oil flushes the debris away, those particles that flushes it out of the bearing and they're filtered out. And also that flushing action of the oil keeps the heat down. Okay, as we generate, the spall gets bigger, we start to generate more heat. So with an oil-fed bearing, that flushing action of the oil actually takes some of that heat away, so it'll last longer than a grease-fed bearing. So that's the first thing when you see a fault. Is it an oil-fed bearing or is it a grease-fed bearing? Because the oil-fed bearing is going to last long. So anyway, so we got the uh, stage two of the bearing. It's going to last a long time. So at this stage two, this bearing is probably going to last another six months, eight months, whatever it may be, dependent on the conditions, of course, and the oil and all the filtering, and all those other variables involved. So stage two, still see it here. Okay, we still got a while to go. What happens then in the third stage is that these discrete lines will still be there. Okay, so now we'll see the frequency range. So whatever this frequency is here, it'll correspond with the frequency range on the bottom. So now when we get to the third stage, we're seeing the outer race uh, bearing failure here, but also what happens is we get this kind of random noise. So any noise that's not sinusoidal or, or uh, in sync, so in vibration, the, it has to be repeatable, right? The same period of time for each revolution or whatever. Random noise in the spectrum, that crunch of noise, any of that kind of stuff. So now what's happening is debris is starting to circulate through the bearing. You're starting to make more noise. So when the box hears that random noise, it doesn't know what to do with it. It doesn't know what frequency. So what it does is it throws it down here and we call this raised floor noise. So this bottom starts to come up and these peaks here start to disappear. They start to go away. This is the time that you change the bearing, okay? I see the bearing here. When I take that bearing out and my boss looks at it, he's gonna see a small, about the size of the end of your baby finger here. So you know you're right, you made the right call. You see the mark in the bearing. That's the problem with this. If you take a bearing out too early, there's no mark on it that you can see with your eye. Your boss thinks you screwed up, that you did a bad job, that you missed something. You didn't miss something. If you looked at this with a microscope, you would see the mark in it. But down here, when we change it now, this bearing here, there was still some life left in the bearing, but we got the bearing, we changed it out before this bearing started to deteriorate and started to affect other parts of the machine, right? So that bearing, if it totally collapses, then if it was a motor, then the next thing our stator's touching our rotor, we destroyed the whole motor. So instead of changing out a little bearing like this, it might take two or three hours, you have to scrap the whole machine, right? So really important to get the bearing out in this phase right here. Once we move into four, what happens is now the raceway is wiped out from here to here, all the way across. There's all metal all coming, churning through there. When you listen to it, you just hear a bunch of crunching kind of sounds. And so what happens now is this stuff goes away because it's not generating any frequencies anymore. There's just a bunch of debris that's rattling around. So now what you'll see is 
at one times in the last stage because there's no fit left on your bearing. It's nothing the thing every revolution is going. It's moving, shaking, and then also what you'll see is all this random noise down on the bottom. Once you get to that phase there, you have failed. Okay, you, if you don't catch a bearing till it gets to this phase, then you aren't worth anything at your job. You should be get into another business or start doing something else, okay? So once we see this, that bearing is shot, and basically there's no prediction anymore. When we get to this phase, it could last 10 minutes, it could last two days, we don't have any idea. You're just at a crap. You're just taking the dice when you get to this. So stage, between stage two and stage three is really the optimal time to change the bearing. So all you have to know is the early stages, way out here, high frequency, can't see it with your eye. And then as that spall gets bigger, it moves farther down the, the uh, spectrum here. And then where it is, we can tell what stage is at. So, and you're not gonna learn that in a day. Years of looking at thousands of spectrums to come up with that.